and welcome. My name is James Packman and I'm the Rector, the Senior Minister here at Holy Trinity Church in Nailsy and I'm delighted to welcome you to Sunday Catch Up. Sunday Catch Up is where we take the Bible reading and the talk from last Sunday but make it available on the internet to those who might be blessed and encouraged by it and I hope that you are. If you would like to be in contact with us, please do get in contact. The details are on our church website, uh, www.htnailsy.org.uk. Please let us know if you've got any questions or if there's any way in which we can help you at this time. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you can. May God bless you today. There are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 20. You'll find it on page 988 in the Bibles. Beginning at verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down asked a favour of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand, and the other at your left hand in your kingdom. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight 
and followed him. Thank you, Jeff. Just before uh, Jenny comes to speak to us, let's pray, shall we? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you do care deeply about us and you want us to know more of you and your wonderful ways and that you've given the Bible to us to teach us. As Jenny now comes and helps us explore the Bible, we pray that you would teach us, teach us your ways so that we might more closely walk in them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jenny, thank you. I have my watch because in Tanzania, sermons can be known to go on for an hour. So that would be quite standard, actually. So need to make sure we don't do that. I was very thankful when I saw on the rota that t- today I was given the opportunity to share about serving. It's one of my favourite passages, the one that was read, um, and I really enjoy teaching on this because I think it is so important for us all as disciples of Jesus. If I had told my younger self, maybe when I was 15, 16, 17, that I was going to serve in a missions organisation for 17 years, and then go on to open a charity, I would have laughed a lot. But understanding the Christian call to serve was a real game changer for me in my spiritual journey as a disciple of Jesus. What Jesus has to say about serving has very practical ramifications in the life of a believer, whether we are in our hometown or whether we are overseas. There are many definitions on, uh, about service, what it should look like, where and when, and in every culture, often according to your sex and age, there are different norms and expectations. For example, I learned when I went to visit Fadili's father's home that one of the traditions there is that when you serve a meal, first of all, you need to warm some water and then t- take a jug and a basin and go round and, and wash everyone's hands, starting with the father and then going on. And unfortunately, the first time I did this, I hadn't warmed the water. So it was cold water, which was not very appealing because it's a little bit chilly up in the north. So he very kindly suggested to me that next time I warm the water first. So obviously did that. We need to follow a biblical example. What does the Bible have to say about a lifestyle of service? And as I have reflected on this passage that we read today uh, many times before, and, and as I was again in preparation of sharing today, I thought, what is Jesus saying? He was speaking to a particular group of people at a particular time in a particular place. And upon reflecting on this passage, I did come away, I've come away with two pictures about the meaning of serving. There is the world's way, and there's the way of Jesus. The world's way, as he puts it, the Gentiles lord it, lord over people. They don't come to serve, to come alongside, as Jesus says. The world's way is all about their own interests, It's not looking to the interests of others. They use force in the world, position, status. But Jesus uses influence to serve. And even when he's talking to to the mother of his two disciples, again, he's, he's reflecting, he's using influence. He's not using his status. He's not using force. The world's way when it comes to service often seems to include a sense of raising oneself up rather than humbling oneself, which is so clear from the words of Jesus. It's about taking, what can I get for me? Or what can I get for my people? I want this position for them. I want them to be on your right and your left hand. But it's about what can you give? 
That is Jesus' way. Serving through looking out for the interests of others. Through influencing, through humbling ourselves and being generous in our giving. And although hundreds of years have passed since Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, I imagine that we can all think of people that we've met or seen from afar that reflect one or, or two or three of these different values. They reflect these different worldviews on service because these principles are timeless. But let's not just think about others. What about ourselves? What flavour do I give off? Am I reflecting more of the world's set of values in, I, in my service? Or am I reflecting more of Jesus' values as I serve? My, one of um, my favourite passages in the Bible, specifically about this topic of serving, is found in John 13, and I am going to read it now. Verses 1 to, I think it's 13, but my printer printed with stripes through it, so I can't quite read that number. But you can find it on page 1081 of the Pew Bibles. So John 13. It was just before this Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part it with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on and returned to his place, do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sends him. This is such a profound passage, such a profound example of servanthood that we find in the Gospels. The cultural context of this was that the job that Jesus took upon himself to do was actually only meant to be done by a Gentile. It was deemed too unworthy, too dirty, too disrespectful for a Jew to do. This was not a job of a Jew. And Jesus, not only a Jew, but a leader, a respected teacher, took it upon himself to wash his disciples' feet. That's why Peter, outraged, couldn't comprehend allowing his Lord, his teacher, to touch his feet because it was totally unheard of. It would be a sign of great disrespect, an insult, an offence for Jesus to do that job, but he chose to do it. 
I try and think of what could that mean for us today. And the closest thing I've come up to is giving your dirty underwear to someone and letting them hand wash it. That's the closest thing. And I don't know if I'm doing it justice. I don't know if I've gone a little bit too extreme. But just to give an idea of truly how unheard of, how awkward and uncomfortable that would have been for the disciples to allow Jesus to touch their feet and to clean them. So some reflections upon this passage. Already we've seen how Jesus has broken, totally blasted away the social norms and expectations. He took off his robe, that sign of his, his role as their teacher. Teachers in that time would wear particular clothes to show that they were a rabbi. He took it off, taking off very physically his status, and he picked up a towel to serve. Not only that, he served all. He knew when he was doing that action of washing their feet, he was not only washing the feet of his closest friend, but also Judas, the one whose fingers were a little bit light and would go into the money bag, the one who he knew was going to betray him, but he still served him. He still ministered to him. We need to follow the example that Jesus told us he was giving us. Jesus says very clearly, I have given you an example and you should do just as I have done. If you search through the Gospels, I don't think you'll find such a clear command as that. This is the example I am doing and you also need to do this. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we're going to be washing everyone's feet all the time, does it? What does it mean practically? Jesus, throughout his ministry, served uh, in a number of different ways. But his heart was always positioned to leave someone better off than when he met them. He was always looking for their interest. Sometimes he was an encourager. Sometimes he spoke a stern word. He was a listener, spent time listening to the Samaritan woman at the well. He prayed. He healed. Very practically, he calmed storms when that was needed and provided lots of bread and fish when people were hungry. It looks different in different times, in different circumstances. I love taking meals to friends who've just had a baby. I love connecting people with mutual interests. I love teaching mothers that it's okay to talk to their children about their bodies and to call the bits the right name. That they can empower their children to say no if someone is wanting to touch them inappropriately, that they can be a safe place for their child. I love giving a safe space to teenage girls to talk about the situations and the pressures that they face and where they can ask sensitive questions about life without the fear of being shamed or punished. I love introducing people to the country that I have become very familiar with and the culture that is now also part of my culture. Those are some of the ways that I can serve. But how about all of us? How about you here in Nailsey? This church has so many opportunities uh, and different activities that you can get involved in, whether it's with your next door neighbor, whether it's a group at church, or something in the wider community. I love sitting and listening. I love praying with people. Sometimes here I find it difficult because I'm still learning about the culture, but sometimes I see people and I just want to go and touch them. I want to go and pray with them. Uh, here we are given different gifts. There are people who have the uh, discernment gift. They can see a need of someone very easily than anyone else. There are people who have been given gifts of healing. 
They can touch your legs, your, your, your chest, your head, and you receive healing. And God gets glory and people get well. There are people who are looking for someone just to smile at, to smile at them. There are people who here, they have a beautiful smile that if you smile in, for someone who is down, feel, feels encouraged. So it's good to identify your gift, the area of your strength. I, as Jenny was also sharing about the Jesus position and Peter, sometimes we can be in both positions where you need to serve but as much as you are ready to serve, it is as important if there are people to be served. Are we ready to, to bring out those dead pans? What does that really like, a, a dead pan, uh, pans? It's those things that are hurting us. Am I being abused? Have I been abused? Have I? Is there any issue in my heart that I'm experiencing that is vulnerable, making me vulnerable? Am I open? Can I serve Jenny by telling her what I'm going through, that she is able to practice a gift on me of listening? So uh, there is a lot of things that in, in each one of us, God has given us that we can practice them and we can and then strengthen the body of Christ and we are doing our job of service. There's all moments, just as Jesus. We can see with Jesus moments of receiving service and moments of being the server. So that's a good reminder. And it, it can be uncomfortable. It wasn't easy for Jesus, I'm sure, to agree to take on his greatest role of serving us by going to the cross. We can read of how he struggled and wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane. There are moments of sacrifice. There's moments when it is hard. But a caution, a caution to finish. In the world, a servant is only valuable because of their work. It is task-focused with very little relationship and no intimacy. It's just about business. One of my aunts, she lived in Dubai, and it was very normal there for, to have women over from the Philippines that would work in the home. And she told me one day, one day, I tried to be their friend, but it just doesn't work. They stop working. But serving God is different. God did not choose us to use us. God primarily desires relationship with us. That is his priority. Jesus served and worked as an outward expression of his inner life with his Abba Father. He only did what he saw his Father doing. It didn't mean he said yes to every rota, every opportunity, sometimes there is a place for saying no. He let the rich ruler walk away. He didn't follow him, chasing him, trying to persuade him with many words. He served as he saw his father serving. As I said, an outward expression of his inner life with his Abba Father. He didn't get grumpy, complain, he didn't get bitter, pointing fingers at others, blaming people. He probably did get tired, that's a very normal human response. In the story of Mary and Martha, he reminds us that only one thing is needed. In the context of serving, we must not lose sight of our relationship with Jesus, our relationship with him and our Father. We must be rooted and motivated and inspired and energized by that. And when we're not, we need to say no. 
Jesus said it himself in John 15:15. 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants. I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. We serve as friends. I love him, so I serve him. This is the practical outworking of our faith, wherever we are. So do take time in the days in the week ahead to think about what does serving look like for me in this season, in this stage of life? Is there something in your neighbourhood? Is there something in the church that you can get involved in that is that natural outworking of your relationship with God? So may our God bless each of us as we continue to serve and discover how we can serve. May Holy Spirit remind us to be other-minded. May Holy Spirit inspire us and guide us creatively in ways to leave the person in front of us better than when we met them. Amen.